Welcome to From the Mind of Christine McConnell. Today we are doing a photography episode. I'm really excited about this one because I've been doing photography for about 20 years and I can't wait to show you all of the things that I've picked up along the way. So with that said, let's begin. Let's talk about staging because this is a really important part of this process. I always sort of run through my whole house and grab little bits and pieces because everything in the shot should lend itself to the story that you're trying to tell. So feel free to just sort of pick and choose throughout your house what you're going to use and then just put it back when you're done. funny side effect of doing this, by the way, is sometimes you find a much better place for something that's in your house. So I'm thinking I'm going to be standing right here. We're going to have some pedestals. We can put like a couple of the kitties on independently. And now we just have to find all the props. So the shape that we're filling in here is, it's going to ultimately be a square. So all of the little areas that we're going to be filling in need to sort of fit within um, that little area, if that makes sense. Let's talk about equipment. What I like to use is a high end or a good quality digital camera because they typically have something called an interval timer setting meaning you can program the camera to take a picture every few seconds and you don't have to be standing behind it pushing the button over and over again. Something else that's really helpful is a good quality weighted tripod. We're going to be doing something called a composite image, meaning we're going to be shooting something over a long period of time over and over and over again. And so I like to mark the floor where the tripod is resting with some masking tape in case for some reason I knock it I can easily put it right back and it's not going to interrupt the image. What I have been shooting with lately is a Sony a7 III and I'm using a full frame lens. So I don't want to bore you to tears with an in-depth, you know, how to operate a camera, but there are three really helpful things to know about and that is your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture. I don't know how to really quickly explain everything, but I'll sort of gloss over what those things mean and how they apply to taking an image. Let's first talk about aperture. Aperture is essentially going to affect your depth of field in an image, meaning if everything's gonna kind of be in focus or if you, you're gonna have your subject sort of really sharply in focus and the things either before them or after them will be kind of blurred out if your aperture is low, which is, I think, ideal. It makes things look very pretty in certain instances. So a low aperture means that your camera is open very wide and the hole is allowing a lot of light in. And a higher aperture means that your hole is very tiny and small, allowing very little light in, and more of the things in your image will be in focus. Now let's talk about ISO. The higher the number your ISO is means you can shoot in a lower lighting setting, meaning if you're in somewhere that's dim and you can't control the light, raising the ISO is going to allow you to shoot better in that setting. But if you go too high with that ISO, your image can end up being really grainy. So ultimately the desirable effect is to have your ISO as low as possible and just light everything as well as you possibly can. The last technical thing I'm going to touch on is your shutter speed. The shutter speed dictates how quickly your camera is going to take an image. So if you are shooting in full daylight, meaning everything's well lit and it's an action shot, you know, children running around, somebody jumping in a pool, 
you want your shutter speed to be as fast as it possibly can be and it's going to end up resulting in a very crisp fast image the only caveat to this is you need to do that in a setting that is very well lit if you are in a dim setting where maybe you're doing a portrait you want your subject to sit very still and you want your shutter speed to take a lot longer so it has more time to collect all of the details in the image and you just don't want a subject that's moving because otherwise it can end up being blurry. Okay. I'd like to control the lighting in this shot so I can shoot theoretically at any time of day and the image will look the same. So when I do this, I like to block out all natural light that is coming in. In this house, I have the added benefit of most of the windows have shutters on them, but most people don't have that. And so what I like to do is on a large window or door, if there are little brackets at the top for like a curtain rod, it's very nice to string some twine across that and lay like a heavy, dark piece of fabric over it. Something else you can do is take little tack push pins and discreetly push those in along the wall above the doorstop or window frame. And it's just a really sort of simple quick fix to eliminating excess light. Fog machines. These are such handy, fun things to have around, even if you're not a photographer. Spirit Halloween sells one that's called a low laying fog machine. They're incredible because you put a little bit of ice in here. And if you're in a room that's at either at room temperature or a little bit warm, it causes the fog to sort of float around the floor really, really creepily. I absolutely love them. There's a million different uses for them. So I don't know, get it for work, get it for fun. They're just an incredible investment that are gonna last a long time. Let's talk about lighting. Of all of the things I'm ever gonna show you, this bit of information is going to be so valuable to you. If you are shooting yourself, Go through your house and find a fluorescent light bulb and find an incandescent light bulb, which is what this is. Put a fluorescent light bulb over your skin and look at what it does to you. And then look at what an incandescent light bulb does. Incandescent light is soft and buttery on your skin and it diffuses things a little bit, especially in photos. Fluorescent is really great for bug lights. <laughs> making things look terrible and saving you money on energy. So, which, you know, I love doing things for the planet. I want to be the best person I possibly can be. Just don't make me look uglier. So <laughs> I don't have any fluorescent light in my house. I won't judge you if you do, but I really, really like incandescent light. If you are shooting yourself and you're on a little bit of a budget or you're just starting out, I really suggest going to like a Lowe's and finding these really inexpensive clamp lights with a large incandescent bulb and a dimmer. Buy kind of like a handful of them that you can set up around yourself. 
Because obviously we're doing this professionally now, we use these. It is called, it's by Pixel. It's a GS1 and it's got like a, diff, like a screen on it that diffuses the light because this is LED and it is really effective. The reason I like them is because you can adjust everything really quickly within them and setup goes really, really fast with them. But if you know, you're not constantly doing it for a business, this is a really, really great alternative. So to clarify, these are the light bulbs that I do not allow in the house. And this is a combination of fluorescent light and LED bulbs that are sold everywhere and most people have in their houses. They just tend to make people look too harsh. And then this is what I actually like is any kind of incandescent bulb. I really particularly love the Edison bulbs. That's what I use all around my house and just makes everything look soft and inviting. And these are the lights we have been shooting with for the last year. You might want to purchase a tripod with them because it just makes setting them up so much easier. They are about 60 ish dollars for the light itself. And then the tripod can run about 30 to $40. A helpful tip I can give you here is how important backlighting in image is. I always prefer to have a really strong, brighter light behind me and something a little dimmer and softer in front of me. And what that does is it creates a little bit of a halo effect around your subject and makes your image, I feel like, pop. I always go back and reference like how the image is coming along, see how far I've come, and then just keep adding until everything feels like it looks how you want it to. This process is very fiddly and you just have to keep tweaking as you go. For a big photo like this, I like to set everything up one day and then go to sleep <laughs> because on the day that you have to get made up and be on camera, you don't want to be killing yourself. So it's really, really nice to set everything up the night before, rest yourself. And so when you are taking pictures of yourself, you look as like fresh and nice as possible. So that's what we're going to be doing right now while we sleep. If you're enjoying this episode and want to see more, as well as support the making of this series, follow the link below to Patreon. There, I post a new episode every month, as well as doing a monthly question and answer live stream where I tell ghost stories, do live craft alongs, and even have movie nights. There are also occasionally contests. The winner of our last one will be coming here to stay on the grounds for a weekend this month. Some projects are simple and others are very involved, like this last one where I featured how to transform tattered old shipping boxes into an elegant dress form that I'll be using to design clothes on next year. It's the next day and now we are ready to shoot and all I have to do is wake up some of the characters that are going to be in the shot.
that way. Let's talk about beauty for taking a photo. I always set my hair in these Conair hot rollers. I've kind of Frankenstein this a little bit. It originally had a few smaller rollers and I've just replaced them with this size because they work the best for me. I set my hair, completely let it cool, and then when I take it down, I brush it out thoroughly and then tease up the ends to create like a fullness all around me. A few other things you can do to look as good as you can in a photo. Body makeup, any kind of matte foundation will do this. You just rub it on your arms, legs, chest, and it just tends to make you look a little bit nicer in a photo. Something else. <laughs> how long that's gonna go for okay it's done darker eyebrows when you are taking a picture of your face I would say eyebrows that are a little bit darker than you're used to tend to make you look a little bit more attractive and then the last tip I will give you is I like to put perfume on right before I take a picture because it sort of puts me in the mood a little bit and I feel like if you feel like pretty on the inside it's going to show up a little bit more in a photograph These are the hot rollers I use, and I misspoke a little bit. The larger ones are the ones that I discarded, and the lavender ones are the ones that I use. To hold the rollers in place while they set, I use clips on the crown of my head and my temples, and then on the lower parts, I use these little prong things. I wrap my hair and allow it to totally cool and set. And the nice thing about this is you can do it a little bit early and then work on other things while it sets. trick I can tell you about is this thing called Lumify. It's like a eye whitener for photos. Actually, it's just for whitening your eyes at any point in time. I went to an ophthalmologist and she suggested it and I've been using it in photos forever. It just brightens everything up so like maybe 40 seconds to a minute before you start taking pictures. Drop a few of these in if you need them. I don't know. Maybe you're an alien and maybe your eyes are already really bright and beautiful, but mine need a little bit of help. While my hair sets, I'm going to shoot one of my other little creatures in the meantime. Let me check that. I think we've got it, but I just want to double check. It's okay. It's I find that a curl has set a little too tightly around my face. I like to take a roll brush and a blow dryer and soften it just a little bit. I'm now shooting myself using that interval timer setting. The camera is taking a shot every three seconds and I give it enough time to develop each one and then I shift and try a different position so I have several options.
Now let's discuss pet photography. This is one of those really, it can be a very frustrating process and you kind of just have to work with whatever comes of it. You don't wanna do anything scary if you're gonna have your pets in the shot. So the fog machines all have to be shut off. Anything that's gonna produce anything that you know causes anxiety in them, you want to eliminate. Something else is you don't wanna force them ever into a position or anything like that because for one, it will show up in their face. And for two, they'll just get angry and it'll just, it will be unpleasant. They're not gonna like it. You're not gonna like it. One big thing is don't ever obviously do anything that puts your pet in jeopardy trying to take a picture. Always really be mindful of their safety and making sure that anything you're doing, they're gonna be okay with. And just a lot of patience, toys, making funny sounds, graham crackers, <laughs> if you're Mr. Poof, um, just, Basically, take your time and know that you can work really hard and maybe you're not going to get the shot you sort of envisioned, but just kind of work with whatever you end up getting. And I'm not the only one who needs their hair done before having a photo taken. get into something I absolutely love and is so controversial, Photoshopping. I have a whole philosophy myself about this. I know a lot of people feel a lot of different ways about photo editing. In my mind, you do all sorts of things every day to make yourself look better. Makeup, hair extensions, eyelashes, all sorts of things you do. And for me personally, I don't see this step as being terribly different. Since the invention of paintings, images, replicating anybody's image, we've been editing and making things look as nice as possible. So I personally look at it as an art form. I prefer fantasy over reality. So I'm gonna be showing you all sorts of fun, unusual things that I do with Photoshop. And I think if you go into it knowing it's a fantasy, that's sort of a more fun way to approach it. My first step is to load all of my images into Bridge, and then I go through and I pick my very favorite one of each of the subjects. Once I'm ready to start compositing characters, I will copy one image and paste that over onto my master file, then create a layer mask and using the paintbrush, I will begin to incorporate just the parts that I want to add.
the last minute, I realized I wanted Vicky Lou's painting of my Mr. Biggles to be closer to me. So I reshot that little section of it and now I'm having to blend it back in. So here's something fun I can show you. My captive is six feet tall, but I want him to be a little closer to lurch height. So I'm going to be extending him to be about seven feet tall. So right about here, I'm starting to realize I should have had all of the fog machines turned off while I was photographing each of these characters. And now it's causing me this issue of, you know, merging them all together. It's fixable. And just so you know, I make, I make mistakes all the time when I do photography and I do this composite work. The one thing I will tell you is when you do mess up, it's usually an opportunity to like get better at working with this program because it is a really complex program that you spend. I spent years learning how to use Photoshop and I bet there's still tons I don't even know about. So sometimes a mistake ends up giving you the opportunity to learn how to use the software a little bit better. So try not to get too discouraged and remember it's Photoshop, the sky's the limit. You can virtually fix anything. Because I moved the captive from his original spot and enlarged his size, he is not aligning with the background anymore. And I also moved those pictures. So I'm going to have to very carefully cut around him. And the trickiest part is going to be around the candles. <laughs> I ultimately realized that he needed a more dashing looking head, so I gave him a bit of a transplant. Again, all I'm doing is blending layers one on top of the other, and I keep all of these layers intact until I know the image is fully composited. All of my initial passes in blending a layer are usually very rough and then I keep going over the image and just refining it as I go each time. So in addition to Photoshop, I'm going to tell you about a few of my other favorite things that I love to use when editing an image. I always use Lightroom right at the end of the photo. And this is a great opportunity you'll see to blend the colors, shift them any which way that you possibly want, and then also create like gradients and things like that within the image, sharpen, soften, whatever you want in Photoshop itself. I downloaded these brushes, I think from DeviantArt years ago. They are hair and skin brushes, skin texture. They have been so incredibly useful. I use them all the time and they are something that don't come with Photoshop stock. So knowing that is really helpful. There is also a software called Nick software, N-I-K. I use that for aging photos and that is a plugin that goes into Photoshop. So if you want to use that. That is how I make pictures look super like old black and white. So I'm just trying to share with you as much as I possibly can. I don't think I'm even using the Nick software in this particular image, but the more you know, I think the better this episode is going to be. 
So while I'm still in this layer blending mode, I'm using the hairbrush very roughly to kind of give these a little bit more detail. But once the image is completely flattened, I will go in with these hair tools and actually paint in individual hairs to make it look as natural and real as possible. Something I like to do if I'm blending something that has like fur or hair like I am right here, I like to adjust the opacity of my paintbrush, meaning it is only allowing a little bit of the layers to blend at a time so you have a lot more control. And ultimately, if you do it right, it has a really soft, diffused look. Also, just so you know, this is sped up like 400%, so <laughs> it does not go this fast normally. Because these candles were not originally in this position, I need to reintroduce a candle glow effect. And so what I'm doing is pulling a little snippet of a candle from another image and bringing it in here. And I'm going to very softly blend just a little bit to give it a little bit of a glow and warmth. Now to go in and start reintroducing that fog that I had shot. While we're doing this, let's take a second to talk about saving your work. Oh my gosh, I cannot stress it enough. Every five minutes you should be saving your work because it's incredible how much you can accomplish in let's say 15 minutes. And if you lose that because the program decides to shut down, you will be so frustrated. So I try to remember every five minutes to save my work. If I find myself needing an element of an image that I don't have, let's say fog or a bird or something like that, I love to go to Adobe Stock and download either an image or a PNG. For the fog, I'm getting a PNG, but for something else, I would probably just want an image and then cut that out of it. My dress using the erase tool to take out any sharp crisp hard lines and then going over with a skin texture brush to gently soften everything while not completely removing the shadows and highlights. Now that we're really getting into this, I will bring up something that I didn't mention earlier when I was talking about that I love the fantasy of Photoshop. Restraint is also something I really, really like to utilize because, you know, this is a program that makes things, that has the capability of making things look much, much better and also much, much worse. So when you are Photoshopping yourself or somebody else, keep in mind you still want them to look like they look. It's only intended to make them look a little bit better. And I think, you know, a lot of the controversy with, with Photoshop comes from people taking things way too far, turning normal people into cartoons, which by the way, if that's what you're into, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But for me personally, I feel like I use it as a tool to enhance what is already there. 
And I feel like that's just something that's helpful to keep in mind and make sure work just look a little bit more professional and like appealing to the eye. And now I am going to completely change the color of my dress. And the way that I'm doing this is I have composited everything I want to, flattened the image, and now I'm going to duplicate that copy, change the color of that. I'm gonna take out all of the saturation, add the color that I want, and then just like we did with the compositing, I'm going to composite on this layer of color. now using that same technique to suck the life out of my captive and I'm even going to darken him up in a few key places to make him look a touch more sinister. Here I'm using the burn tool to darken and create these like spooky looking veins. So the burn tool darkens things and the dodge tool lightens things and these are tools you will find right over on the left hand side of your tool set. And now it is time to start editing myself. If you have lit yourself extremely well, you will find you don't need to do too much, but even in the very best lighting, generally most people need a little bit of a touch up. And so what I'll be doing is gently smoothing certain areas of my skin and adding a little bit of contrast. When it comes to storytelling photography, I kind of feel like there is no detail too small not to be addressed. And so I always like to go over the entire image and just embellish anything I feel like would benefit from it. I found this 1800s fairy tale book years ago on eBay and I have just been waiting to find an excuse to showcase it. I'm now using Liquify to adjust the silhouette of my hair. Liquify is a tool you can find up at the top in filters. It is an amazing tool for shifting the silhouette of your figure or bending or stretching anything you can think of. Here I'm using the Dodge tool to brighten up the highlights of my hair. Now, none of the real bats in the house wanted to come out for this photo, so I'm going to go back to Adobe Stock and find some. Now, if I'm being honest, there are no flying fox bats in my house, which I would just love if that was the case. But I'm going to try to find different images of them that will work in this lighting setting. I would say if you are ever adding something from a completely different photo, just make sure that the lighting on that subject mirrors what's going on in your image. And now to give it a realistic blend, I'm going to add a motion blur effect because you are almost never going to get a crisp photo of a flying bat in your house.
now for the final touch, I'm importing my flattened image as a JPEG into Lightroom and I can change all of the little colors that make all of the difference in the world. I always like to shift my yellows to a slightly more orange hue and increase the luminosity of yellows in an image. And I also like to add a little bit of a creeping in vignette around a picture. We are all finished. I absolutely love how this turned out. It's one of those things, I know it's a massive amount of work to do, but the reward I feel is absolutely worth it. I have plans for doing future photography episodes just because there's still so much that I didn't even cover here. I would love to feature beauty photography. And then also, I don't know if there's a way that we could possibly do an episode specifically for Photoshop that maybe we can do it in a live stream format and we can just sit together for an entire day and go through the whole thing and I can answer every single question about how I do every little aspect of it. So look forward to all of the fun things that are gonna be coming from that. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves and I'll see you again very soon.